good to see you guys. Welcome this morning to all of you who are with us for the first time. Curtis, thank you for being with us. Curtis has uh, served in the Army, retired as a captain here, so give it up for Curtis, huh? Thank you. Right. We've got a lot of vets and some active duty here today, and uh, Dan Lasich, he's at your church. He's a warrior, so watch out. Watch your back. And uh, uh, Dan, don't give it. Don't give it to me. Just uh, just watch your back. Uh, but uh, you're visiting Dan's church. It's a great church, and uh, we're thankful for that. Guys, we are in a study in the book of Joshua. And um, but listen, everybody knows what's been going on with uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Let's bow our heads and hearts in prayer just for a minute and pray for that situation. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you are the supreme king of heaven and earth. And even as we look into the book of Joshua today, we ask that you would be with the people of Ukraine. We pray that you would be with the pastors and the people in the churches, the leaders, the men who are leading their families, who are concerned. Father, for those that have lost loved ones already, we just commit that whole situation to you and pray that you would bring it to a conclusion quickly. But we pray for courage for your people in particular, and uh, particularly the fathers, the men that have to lead the families and sometimes fight, and for sure, Christian men who have to deal with uh, the challenge of fighting now. So we commit all that to you and for your good resolution, for we pray in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Well, guys, it is interesting as we uh, look in our study in Joshua, week two, week two in the book of Joshua. And uh, last week, if you were here, uh, and if you weren't, weren't here, you can go back and, and watch that video from last week. Uh, I, I want to just tell you briefly about the book of Joshua, one of the easiest books to outline, four major sections of the book of Joshua, crossing into the land, the taking of the land, then the dividing of the land, and then speeches in the land. Boy, that's a piece of cake uh, for a big book in the Old Testament. Uh, it's very easy to understand. And we're in the first several chapters, first five chapters, about the crossing into the land. And, uh, uh, boy, I tell you, I never thought when I planned to teach on Joshua that I'd be talking about the Israelite invasion of the land at the time that an invasion was taking place across the world. You can't plan this. And, and, and rightfully so, people might say, well, wait a minute, and I tried to clarify this last week, what's the difference between the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the Israelite invasion of Canaan? It's a good question. The big difference was this, as I said, that as we look at this situation, we see that God was using Israelite, Israel in a particular way to accomplish two things. One was the judgment of the people of Canaan. It's very easy for us to think that all nations are equal, but all nations are not equal in the sight of God. Uh, what we see in the Old Testament is that the Canaanites, the ancient Canaanites, were about as evil as you could get, bad to the bone. I mean, they were sacrificing their kids to idols. Uh, they were in complete rebellion to the God of the universe. And so one of the, one of the major tasks of the Israelite was to bring the judgment of God upon the Canaanites in that time. A lot of times people think that judgment is only something that happens at the end of time. False. <laughs> Uh, God is the supreme king of heaven and earth. He is the just God of all, and he can bring judgment whenever he pleases. The second movement, the second idea of the, of, of the Israelite in, invasion of Canaan was to provide a homeland through which the Messiah would come. God has a plan. God is always on the move. And it's important for us to remember that Israel was to be God's holy nation in that place through whom the Messiah would come to save the world eternally. So Israel really uh, had a divine uh, job, an important function, uh, and, uh, um, and it's important to keep that in mind as Christian men as we are trying to understand this invasion versus the Russian invasion. They do not have similarities, although there is, 
they have the similarity of being an invasion. That is what is going on here, but for different reasons. Now, I can imagine someone saying to me, Pete, wait a minute. You just said that the ancient Canaanites are so bad that God had to judge them. What about our country? What about, what about the way we view our unborn? Uh, what about America? America is kind of bad to the bone at this point. Someone once said, and that's a legitimate point, someone once said, if God doesn't judge America, he owes an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, let me say this in response to that. God does not owe an apology to anybody. For any reason, at any time, because he is the supreme king of heaven and earth and is righteous and perfect and holy in everything he does. But I hear your point. I hear your point. And as we look at, at the text today, we're going to see, uh, we saw last week that Joshua was commissioned as the general to take over for Moses. He is Moses' successor. He was well-trained by Moses. Uh, as I talked to a, a, a former Navy SEAL comes to the Longwood site, he was telling me that, that uh, before they go to a mission, they prepare working together and get used to working together so they know their capabilities and their combat conditions. And, and so uh, we know that Moses trained Joshua through these many, many years and prepared him for this time of taking over and leading. So Joshua was commissioned, we saw last week. And then what we didn't look at in chapter 1 was that Gosh, Joshua then commands the people of Israel, says, get ready, you got three days, we're going in. And then at the end of Joshua chapter 1, all of the people of Israel concur with Joshua. All right, we'll go, we're ready. Only you be strong and courageous because we need strong leadership. We're going to do this, but we're, we're only going to follow you, Joshua, if you are going to be strong and courageous. So that was chapter 1. And now chapter 2, uh, we're going to see four movements in this fascinating, this is better than TV, I want you to know. This is better than a movie. If you will enter in and really put yourself existentially in the situation, I'll try to help you do this before you talk about it around your table. Uh, we see this mission prep before this big mission to go in to Canaan. Uh, and uh, th this, this is the stuff of great epics. Um, it just happens to be true. First of all, we have the intel, Joshua 2.1. I'm just going to read the text as we go with the points rather than read it and then explain it because we just don't have the time. So uh, look at, look at the, uh, Joshua uh, 2.1. Here's the intel. Because if you're going to go on a mission, you've got to have good intelligence, right? And that's what's going on here. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim. Be very careful, as Christian men, how you say that word. Uh, Shittim means acacia trees plural. The em is Hebrew for plural. Don't say it in the singular. It's Shittim. Um, this is around 1400 BC. I take the, uh, the more ancient view uh, of the Exodus, 1450 AD. So here we are at 1400 BC. Joshua, the former spy, is now the general sending spies. Go back to Numbers 13 and you see when Joshua, when he was about 40, was a spy, one of 12, being sent into uh, the promised land to check it out. And Joshua and Caleb, and you're going to love Caleb when we get to him, those two guys came back out of the 12 spies and says, let's go. God's given us the land. Let's take it. But the other 10 spies were whining and faithless and came back to Joshua or to Moses and said, no, if we go in there, we're going to lose. So uh, Joshua has learned some things now. He's about 80. He's now in charge. And he sends the spies in, and he sends two spies secretly. They're not spies that are commissioned. And not, the whole nation doesn't know that these guys are going in there. Joshua's learned. You send a bunch of whiners in, they'll come back whining, and they'll dispirit the people. So Joshua sends these two spies in secretly. He says, you guys report to me, and, and we'll see the report at the very end. Uh, so he sends these guys in and, um, and, and, and to find out what's going on. I talked to that same Navy SEAL, and I said, okay, when Russia invaded, what are our special forces guys doing across the board? And he texted me back. He said, 
the boys are busy. That's all he said. I said, I want to know what our special forces are doing now. I know we're saying we're not sending troops. I go, what are our special forces? He said, the boys are busy. Uh, why? Because you got to get intel. you got to figure out what to do. you got to think of all the possibilities of what's going on in an invasion, and that's what's going to happen. I have no doubt that Joshua was personally trained by Moses here. And I want you to understand, as we look at the map in a sec, I think we got the map right now. Here's the map. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see uh, Jericho on, the, on this side of the map. You see Jericho there, guys? It's Jericho's just on the other side of the Jordan River in Israel before the mountain range that goes up to Jerusalem. Shittim is about six to eight miles away. That's all, about six miles away. Jericho is on the plain at the foot of the mountains about ready to go up into uh, uh, central Canaan. You've got to take Jericho if you're going to take Canaan. The Israelite army used to study the book of Joshua in their training of people. I don't think they do anymore, but they used to. Why? Because this was the ancient way uh, that Israel as a nation took over Canaan. But you had to take Jericho first. It was, a, it was a double-walled city that guarded the way into the center of Canaan. You take Jericho, you can get into Canaan, you can go north, you can go south, and we'll see that's exactly what happened. That was the, the battle plan. But on that plain near Shittim, Let's everybody say that together. I want to make sure you can say that. Okay, you ready? One, two, three. Shatim. Thank you. Thank you. Don't get in trouble talking about this today. The people in Jer do the, let me ask you this. The people in Jericho, do they know that there's about a million Israelites sitting out in the, sh the plain near Shatim? Of course they do. You cannot miss a million people. How many warriors? So, so they know Israel is there. And that shapes this whole narrative. And you have to keep that in mind and understand that the... Let me just say two things about these spies. These guys were tough and aggressive. These were nice, sweet guys. No, they were tough and aggressive guys who were absolutely committed to the mission. You got to keep that in mind. Otherwise, Joshua who's a hardened warrior at this time, would not have chosen them to go in. I got an email from a friend of mine the other day who said, uh, my daughter is dating a guy who's not a Christian, but he's a really nice guy, and she's falling in love, but he's not a Christian. And you know, I did a doghouse uh, blog on this recently. So what should she do? And I said, well, and I took him to 2 Corinthians 6, and I said, 2 Corinthians 6 says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. I said, it's your, your role as a dad to tell your daughter that, that and she was raised in a Christian home, Christian church, and Christian school. It's your job to remind her that she can't marry an unbeliever. And he said, I know. And then he said, he said, but this guy's masculine, and the church seems to be producing such beta men these days. His word was beta men. I didn't say this. He said this. That we're producing so many beta men these days that who are these Christian girls going to marry? They're attracted to masculine men. I said, I get your point. Forge is trying to do something in that way to put, to put the masculinity back in Christian masculinity. I'm trying to put it there. But I want you to note that the kingdom of God has to have men like the spies like the apostles, men who are not just betas, but men who know how to be tough and tender, know when to be tough and when to be tender. And if you listen to the narrative of our day, and many, many churches are, we're not going to be developing the kind of men that we need to develop. Filed out of way. The intel. Now the movement. Movement number two is the intrigue. So that's the intel. They go in, and, and this is what happens, verse 2. I love this. And they, and they went uh, into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, the men of Israel had come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring them out the men who come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out the land. But the woman 
had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, true, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But, but she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax, and she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. So we saw the map, and we saw the intrigue, and there's two questions that come out of this intrigue that the spies get in. The first one, is, uh, first question is prostitutes. Uh, the spies went and found prostitutes. Okay, so first of all, uh, the way we answer that is these were red-blooded Jewish young men. Uh, okay, I grant you that, but they were on mission. They were on mission, and uh, so did they, were they headed to prostitution? No, and they weren't going to find a prostitute. They, they may well have run into her as they, walked, as they were walking in the city, as they were infiltrating the city. They may have said, hey, we need to follow her <laughs> because she looks like a prostitute. She is a prostitute, and she lived, ended up living on, a, on the wall. Again, the, the, the double-walled city of Jericho had wood put across it, and houses were built on the, on the double wall. That's how it worked. It was the low-rent district, if you will, the red-light district, if you will, um, the seedier part of town, maybe a place where they could actually hide out. They didn't have hotels or motels back then. So these guys had to go somewhere, and, and they figured that a prostitute may well, I think, may well know a little bit about the town. Oh, yeah, she probably had stuff on a lot of guys in the town. Actually, this, we'll see in a minute, this was a God thing that they followed this prostitute because this, this, this Rahab was prepped to be their helper. And we'll see that she had made a major trans, transition in her own life. Now, uh, what do I want to say? The second point by way of questions, prostitute, is that a good thing? Well, it, was a, it ended up being a God thing. The second question is, she lied. Question, is it okay to lie? Is, I mean, some, <laughs> I wonder how many of you said something to your wives the other way. I, I'll be home around, I'll be home. You, did anybody lie today? Okay. Is it okay to lie? And, we, and the answer is no. I mean, what commandment? You know, you shall not bear false witness. We're not supposed to lie. But I want to say a couple of things about this. I don't lie very well. And if you, if you ask me to lie for you, number one, I won't. But I can't even lie for you kiddingly. Hey, tell them I'm not coming and then I'm going to show up and surprise. No, I can't keep, I, get, I smile. I, when I lie, I smile. I can't hold in a lie. However, there's, I want you to know two things about lies. Number one, I would lie to protect you if an evil person was coming after you. So, go back to Nazi Germany. I'm protecting Jewish people in my home, and the authorities come to my house and say, do you have any Jews here? Are you protecting any Jews? I'm going to say, no. And they're going to search the place, but if I hide them well enough, uh, they'd be safe. And if they find the Jews, then I'm in trouble. I'm willing to bear the consequences. But I don't owe, I don't think we owe evil people intent on doing evil. I don't believe we know the truth, that they, they deserve the truth in that situation. I would lie for you if people were coming after you, okay? Now, I know what needs a lot more discussion, Bible study, and interaction, right? Okay, but I just want you to know that. Number two, um, I want you to know that there may, there may have been another way to get out of that predicament. Rahab might well have been able to say something else to get out of that without lying, but she's barely converted, at, if at all at this point. And I think the larger point in this text is uh, that, that Joshua is trying to convey is the type of people that God uses to accomplish his plans. I think that's the bigger issue here, is that Rahab lies. Yes, she lies. No, don't lie. But, but the bottom line is God uses prostitutes and publicans. Publicans are tax collectors. And Pharisees, you can see I'm trying to put the P's in here, alliteration. They teach us this in seminary. 
Get the illiterate. Prostitutes, publicans, Pharisees. And God's just like you and me. That God uses in his plan to advance his kingdom. My friend Jim Henderson, who lives out in Arizona, uh, sent me a picture the other day. He's got all this property that he hikes on out there. And, and he sends me these pictures every once in a while just to say, this is where, what mountains are like, don't forget. And he sent me a picture the other day. There was a, a donkey out there, a wild donkey out in the desert area and back. And he sent me a text that said, I'm relieved to see I'm not the only one of these in Arizona. He's a hard-edged guy who loves Jesus. And I think the bigger point here that we need to keep in mind and the intrigue of all this is that, yeah, God uses a prostitute. And he wants to use people just like you and me, hard-boiled people who he brings to Christ to advance his kingdom. And sometimes he needs saltiness and strength. And he's in the process of redeeming us and using us in powerful ways in people's lives. The first movement is the intel. The second movement is the intrigue. The third movement is the deal. Rahab's got a deal. Let me ask you this. I've never been to prostitute a prostitute. I've never I've never talked to a prostitute. Okay? Do prostitutes make deals? <laughs> she makes a deal with these guys. Before the men lay down, and here's the text, before the men lay down, she comes up on the roof and says to the men, by the way, flax that's laid down on the roof, that's what you make linen out of so you make your clothes. And so she had, she had flax up there so she could make clothes. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have, here's her evidence. This is, now understand that she's been under a spiritual transformation. She says, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. Sion and Og were two warriors, and Israel took them down. And the word of the Red Sea and the word of this, this great victory over these leaders spread to Jericho. As soon as we heard it, she says, our hearts melted. And there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your... Listen to what she says here. For the Lord your God... In the heavens above, he is, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. What did she just say there? She just said, my false gods that I've worshipped, I realize, are not gods. But the God of Israel, proof based on the evidence of the Red Sea and the defeat of those guys, he's the true God. She's been converted. She's a prostitute who's become a proselyte. Uh, now, now then, here's the deal. Now then, um, swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign. The word deal kindly is the Hebrew word hesed. It is used 250 times in the Old Testament, hesed. It means the loving kindness of God. It's used particularly in the covenantal relationship that God made with Israel. Hesed, the loving kindness of God. She is basically saying, show the same kind of loving kindness to me that God has shown to you in Israel. God made a covenant with you Israelites, make a covenant with me. Um, that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, when the Lord gives you the land, we will deal kindly with you. The deal. The deal is me. Deal kindly with me, she says, and I will deal kindly. And basically, she could have screamed out at any point, couldn't she? Yeah, yeah. So she, she has these spies a little bit over the barrel. Uh, she says, uh, promise that you're not going to, turn on me, and I won't turn on you. And the guys go, okay, that's good. So it says, when you read verse 15 and following, she let them down by a rope. But before that, she said to them, go to the hill, stay there three days, 
and then you can leave. And as she was letting them down, the guys turned to her, the spies turned to her and said, okay, we w- they, they want to confirm the deal, but they want to clarify the deal. See, the woman sets the terms, and then the guy comes back and says, well, wait a minute, let's straighten this out a little bit. Um, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. They say that again. Rahab, you had us over a barrel. You made us swear this. We had to do it. There was no other way. Otherwise, you'd scream out and and we'd be in trouble. Um, Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window. uh, And if you, and basically as it goes on, if you don't leave that scarlet cord, what color is scarlet, guys? For those of you who don't know what scarlet, red. If you don't put that red cord in the window, uh, then, then we won't know where you are, and, and I can't get the troops to stay away from you. You'll be wiped out with everybody else. We don't know how this invasion is going to happen. They didn't know the walls were going to fall down at that point. Uh, th- these spies didn't know that. None of Israel knew that, but they said, hang the cord. You made us swear, and they say it again. I love this, down in verse 20. But if you tell this business of ours, then we will be guiltless with respect to your oath that you've made us swear. I like that. They looked at this woman who's used to making deals. They said, now look at Were they nice and sweet about this? You made us swear this thing. You don't do your part, we're not doing our part. It's a lot of the junk. Uh, she said, I'm in. The deal was made. Uh, and uh, by the way, many scholars have said and will, uh, have said powerfully about this scarlet cord thread. See, if they put the scarlet cord in there, that was a sign that they were to be rescued, that Israel was to rescue them. And many theologians see here the reality that Joshua, as the prefiguring of Christ, is a savior figure, right? And that clearly, people of God are saved by the blood of Christ, by the scarlet blood of Jesus shed on our behalf. We know that. Interesting, tantalizing little figure. The deal is made. They shook hands, and uh, the army is still sitting out there. Now, I asked some of my pastor friends this past week when the invasion took place. I, I emailed them and I said, "What? What are you? What have you been? What would you be doing if you were a pastor in Ukraine up to this invasion? What would you be doing up to it? And what would you be doing now that they came in?" Some of my friends responded to me, uh, and they said, "Well." Prior to the invasion, (laughs) we'd be praying and fasting. I'd be teaching the word of God. I'd be teaching them that their hope is in Jesus. And um, I said, well, what? what, now that the invasion took place, what would you be doing? Developing communication with my people, making sure I could get my people to safety. Uh, But some of us would have to fight. And, and, and what, a, what a thing. One guy said, I, I become a chaplain in the army. You know, and I, 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 I texted that, an armed chaplain? You know, I mean, that's what's going on. Um, guys, here's the controversial part of my message. Um, there's a million people on the plane The invasion is about ready to take place, and you cannot neglect that there's a million people out there, right? All of Jericho knows. But they're going about their everyday life like there's no big deal. But Rahab, what's happened to her? Some big things have happened to her because of the existential situation of her day. She's looking at this situation, and you say, you can't ignore there's a million people set to invade us. Today is not the same as it was yesterday. And it's interesting, I, as I think of my Ukrainian pastor friends, do, brothers, not friends, I don't have any pastor friends over there, but brothers, I think of the, the challenge that they face, but I think of the challenges we face because I have so many people coming to me and they say, Pete, look at our culture here in America today. There's a million people on the plains and you can't ignore it. Now, I know there's a lot of uh, um, my Christian brothers who, 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 who think that the policies that are going on in our country are okay. They see it. They look around and say, it's no big deal. And there's a lot of people. And then I have other friends that come to me and say, 
the book of Revelation is coming to fulfillment today. Jesus is coming tomorrow. Have you guys experienced those same things? And, and so I go back and forth. I'm like a ping pong ball of those Christians that say, eh, there's no big deal. The policies are all good. What's going on in the other country? It's all good. And then those that are saying, no, Jesus will probably come back tomorrow. Get ready. And, and really, I, I think it's probably somewhere in the middle, but there's a million people. As you look at our culture, here's the controversial part. Here's, you look at American culture, something is different, something is radically different, and you can't ignore it. Well, you can if you want to. But Christians have a very difficult time, ignore, like Rahab, they have a very difficult time ignoring what's going on around us. And, and, you, and, and, and we're trying not to be political. See, that's the problem. Except when you read Jesus, you see Jesus was very political. Jesus confronted all across the board the powers that be of his day. The Pharisees, the scribes, Herod, everybody. Jesus was hunted because he was political. Why? Because he spoke the truth from God's word, and they hated it. And so if you want to call Jesus political, then we have to, we have to understand that there is a tipping point that's happened in American culture uh, that, that is different, something that's significantly different than in my entire life, and I'm as old as dirt. But in my day, I grew up as a kid seeing the Vietnam War. Things are different today than then. Our view of life is worse than it's ever been before. We've got a million and a half people that came into this country illegal. I texted my, my chief of police friend the other day, and I said, hey, I heard four busloads ended up in your city last night in dark. True? And he goes, yep. We're being lied to. Who do we trust? Do we trust our medical community? Do we trust our political leaders? We don't. We don't. We, we, we really are at a very unique place. I can go on, but we are at a very, very unique place in American history, and it's important for us to understand that, um, that, that, that the answer to this situation that we have today is not our pol political leaders. I, I, I feel like I'm, political leaders on both sides are lying to us. I'm to the right of Attila the Hun. I, I, I admit that. But, but, I feel like even guys that used, I used to think were on the right lying to us all the time. Who do you trust? You take the track that Rahab took, and she trusted the God of the universe. And that's where we have to go. And remember that we as followers of Christ have to advance his kingdom. And we have to take this track of all of that. Yeah, I mean, Jesus could come back tomorrow. Wouldn't that be great? You wouldn't have to pay your mortgage off for crying out loud. If you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow, go out and buy a Mercedes today for crying out loud. No, but the, 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 the trust we have to have is in that Jesus was alive from the dead and that we have to advance his kingdom. So what we need is to be men who are advancing his kingdom. And so there's the intel, the intrigue, the deal, the deal, and then the report, uh, verses 22 through 24, I'm, I'm done. And they said to Joshua, truly the Lord has given all into the ha our hands, and they also, the inhabitants of the land, melt away before us. What Joshua needed to hear, what was music to his ears, is these men who said, this is God's will, let's go. We have our marching orders in the Great Commission, we know that we're supposed to be God's men who don't need to be quiet and we need to speak the truth about what's going on in our country and about the need for Jesus and that no earthly leaders can protect us. But Jesus is our trust, just like the spies. Talk about it around your table. I'll get you out of here on time.
All right, Warriors. So my job is to rile you up, and then now it's to shut you down. That's tough. I'm sorry. We're ready to go. Hey, guys. We, uh, oh, I don't want you to miss this. Pick this up on the way out. A bunch of our Forge men are helping Christian help. Uh, they're on the board of Christian help, and they're going to have a great barbecue that's going to be coming up to help fight the whole, whole homelessness thing, and I love that. And uh, so... Uh, Mike Henderson, thank you for being at point on that, uh, and and others in our in our group. So Mike, maybe you'd be back there, daddy daughter dance. Crescent, should they talk to you at the end? Yeah. Huh? Okay. All right. So that's this weekend, and uh, you know the, the moving thing about that daddy daughter dance is at the very end we give vows to the to the daughters and to the dads, and the dads kneel and take vows. It's just a privilege. It's wonderful. It's tender, and it's tough. These are wonderful guys. So uh, that's, that's what, why this is such a big deal. Guys, we got the shirts. Pick them up. They're free, but you can kick in money if you want to. Uh, we have a huge developing online community. We'd love you to come in, pick them up. They're free, but you got to come in and get them because I, I can't send them to you. So come on in, visit us, pick up a shirt. And uh, we'd love to have you do, do that. So let me wrap this up by, by saying, uh, that, tell you the story that somebody sent me, a Russian Jew. A Russian Jew was finally able to emigrate from Israel. And, uh, and so at the Moscow airport, the customs official found a, a statue of Lenin in the guy's baggage. And he said, what is this? And the man said, no, the question is, who is this? This is Comrade Lenin. He laid the foundations of socialism created the future of prosperity of the Roman, uh, Russian people. I've taken it with me as a memory of our dear hero. And the Russian customs officer let him go without any further inspection. So when he lands in Tel Aviv, Israel, the custom official looks at that in his bag and said, what is this? He said, wrong question. Who is this? This is that evil man, Lenin, who caused me to leave Jewish, as a Jew, to leave Russia. I take this statue with me so I can curse him every day. So settling in his new house in Israel, he has a party of his friends who are already there. And one of his friends says, who is this? He says, my dear friend, who is this is not the right question. What is this is the right question. This is 10 kilograms of solid gold that I managed to bring with me without paying customs duty. (laughs) That's my kind of guy. The more, Rahab, the moral, of the, st- the moral of the story is politics is when you can tell the same lies to different people and fool a different audience every time. And we're not going to be fooled. We're going to look around. We're going to see there's a million people on the plains. And you can't ignore what's going on. So you got to be God's man. That's what our country needs, is men who are willing to be great as God defines greatness by coming to faith in Christ and allowing him to develop us as sons, leaders, worker, and warriors to advance the kingdom with the character of Christ. That's who we are. That's what I pray for you and for me every day that we would be God's men as we go out there. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, the greatest Joshua who ever existed, we come to you and we praise you. We thank you that you are our Savior, you are our Lord, and you cause us and call us to live beyond ourselves. You're the one, Lord Jesus, who calls us by saying, whoever wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. Lord, we do that today. We take up our cross today, we follow you. And so I pray that you'd be with me, you'd be with my brothers as we head out into this world. 
that you would make us wise as serpents and innocent as doves, but that you would use us to love our families well, to love people well, and to advance your name to your great glory. We pray these things today in the strong name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And God's man said, Amen. Amen. Get your shirt. We'll see you.